Hey everyone, Wazoo here, and in this video, we are going to go through creating your own empire of microservices using Java Spring Boot. This is going to be so much fun. All right. So as you can see here, I've put together a small diagram on what a typical microservice architecture would look like. In the middle, we've got our API servers, and this is basically just a anything that you want to contain within a single API. So for example, you might have products. If you're a company that sells goods, you might have a microservice for products. You might have a microservice for users. You might have another one for payments, things like that. And so usually what you would try to do is isolate each of these APIs into their own microserver. So each of these boxes represents a microservice, which is just a fancy souped up version of a web service API. And we'll see how that's working as we go through all the different layers that are typically involved in a microservices architecture. So we have two different API servers here in this example and they are communicating with an API gateway as well as a service registry and a config server. So these are a lot of terms that I'm throwing at you all at once, but don't worry, we'll be going through each of these layers as we build out this microservice architecture using Java Spring Boot. As you can see in our demo, we have, we're starting with two API servers. I've got one for, I'm, I'm thinking of sort of a role-playing game environment, an RPG. That's going to be my business logic. And so I've got, I put two basic API servers together. I've got one that will return a set of armor. So it's called, it's an armor microservice. But all it does for the moment is return armor. So I make a, I make a get call and it will return I've got three items in the service right now. We've got cloth armor, chain mail, and plate mail. So that's all that this microservice will handle. And then we've also got one for weapons. So on port 8082, if I make a request to slash API slash v1 slash weapons, we've got three weapons coming back. We've got a one-handed sword, a two-handed sword, and a bastard sword. Now, obviously, there's a lot more properties that each of these things could have. Armor could have, you know, defense values, things like that, uh, that you would typically find in any RPG environment. But I'm just trying to keep it really simple here, that it could be anything. We just have a weapons coming back and armor types coming back. So these are self-contained into two different basic Java Spring Boot web APIs. Uh, we, as you can see here, uh, I'm going to quickly go through armor and weapon is identical right now. So we've got a basic controller of slash API v1 armors and then a, a get, which will return all of the armor types that are currently in our system, which there are three. And we have a basic model of just, you know, an ID, a description, and timestamps. And a basic service, service layer for getting all of the armor all the armor data, saving new armor data. And that's really about it. That's all this web service API does right now. And it's identical on the weapon side. And so currently I'm using environment variables to uh, determine a server port. So let's quickly pop open our application properties. So our server port right now is set up to be the server port value from the environment. And this will come into play later on when we discuss the config server uh, in our microservice architecture. So right now we've got, uh, we're reading from the environment variable when we start up the server on port 8081 and on the weapon service, let's just get that one up here. This one is on port 8082, but again, it's identical. It's just returning weapons instead of returning armor. So port 8081 is for armor. 8082 is for weapons. And so if I was to write some kind of a, uh, a game right now making use of this API, uh, 
then I would be, you know, calling on calling the servers on these different ports to for their respective data. Uh, so these, this is what these API server boxes are here. One's Armor. You know what? Let's just record that right now. Armor, and this one is for weapons. Now, in a microservice architecture, normally what we need to include is what's called a service registry. So a service registry is a another service that's running in which all of our microservices register themselves with this service registry. And that, that way, the service registry understands what kind of microservices are running within its environment. So it's kind of like a, well, it's a registry. It's like a lookup table, a phone book, a, uh, a map of what microservices are running in the current environment that are reporting to this service registry. So let's pop over to start.spring.io. And we'll be coming back here a lot, so you might want to just leave this tab open. So we're going to be sticking to Maven using Java, uh, version 3.3. And so we are going to build a service registry. And so for this, we're going to be making use of a Spring Cloud starter package called Eureka Server, which is developed by Netflix. Okay, so we're going to call this we're going to leave it as a jar, Java 17. And for dependencies, this looks like all we need. Okay, so just to summarize, all we need are the dev tools, the Spring Web, and the Eureka server Spring Boot starters. So Eureka, again, it's uh, published by Netflix under the Spring Cloud umbrella of uh, technologies of Spring Boot. So go ahead and hit generate. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is open up the palm.xml. Okay, well, no, the first thing we can do is expand the, the font. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is open up the palm.xml, and I'm going to add a dependency for reading.env environment variables. So just before the starter web dependency, I'm going to cut and paste another one. And this will come up a lot as we go through this video, this null annotation types. I'm just going to hit disable on that. And yes, when a build file is modified, I'm always going to synchronize the changes. I always want that to happen. Okay, so now we can read .env files. So what we are going to do here is create a, a new file, a .env, and we're going to add in a server port for Eureka, 8761 for the port number. Okay, and then all we're going to need to do is open up the application properties. And we have our Spring application name already filled out to be service registry, which is great. And now we're going to add a few more for Eureka. So one is our server port, which is being read from the environment file, which is server underscore port. And then we're going to be declaring some Eureka variables. So we're declaring an instance host name of localhost because we're running this all on our local machine. And then we, what we want to do is, because this is the actual server, we want to turn off a few of the defaults that are enabled for the client. So we want to turn off registering with Eureka, because this is the server. We, we can't really register with itself. And we don't want to fetch the registry, because we are the registry. And we then declare a default zone for a service URL of Eureka instance hostname, which in our case is localhost the server port, which is server underscore port, and slash Eureka, which is a hard-coded uh, path name. Okay, so once we have all that set up, there is only one more change we need to make. In the actual application, uh, Spring Boot application class, the service registry application, we need to add another uh, declaration for enable Eureka server. And that is it. That's all we need. Easy peasy. So let's go into our uh, service registry 
launcher and start it up. And we should see some OK messages coming up. OK, and we're now running on port 8761. So if we open a browser to port 8761, we get a service registry dashboard from Eureka, which is pretty cool. So let's go here. So we just have some basic environment uh, information, current time, etc. And these are these will be the application instances of microservices that are registering with Eureka. And notice how it's empty. There's nothing there right now. So what we're going to do is add the necessary configurations to our armor and weapons services in order to register itself with Eureka. So let's go back to spring start.spring.io. Let's remove these dependencies here. And instead of hitting generate, let's hit explore. And I'll show you a, a cool thing that we can do. So if you look at the generated POM XML, we see that we have the dependency here. So we can just cut this and paste it into our two projects rather than downloading anything new. So let's close that up. So let's go into our uh, different microservices here. So here's the one for armor. And let's add the dependency for the Eureka, Eureka client. And let's go into the weapon, POM XML. And let's also add one for the Eureka client. Perfect. Okay, this is really cool. All right, now let's go back into the armor side and let's let it download what we need. And this one's also prompting us, so let's let it download what we need. And we get a red underline because we forgot to include, we forgot to include this information. Uh, so under dependency management, we have a section here for uh, Spring Cloud, which it wants to put in. So let's go back to our POM XML, okay. And after, after the dependencies tree here, let's cut and paste this dependency management section. And it's looking for the Spring Cloud version, which we'll go back and steal as soon as we update the armor side as well. So let's paste that in there and let's go back to the browser. You know what, I'm gonna, oops, that's too much. Okay, let's go back to the browser and we'll grab here the Spring Cloud version of 20, 2023 0.3. And let's go back into Armor and update the version there. And then also for Weapon and update the version here. Okay, so that should resolve the issues. There shouldn't be any more red underlining. Let's check out armor. Okay, that looks all right. All right, Eureka, you might say. Okay, terrible joke. All right, so let's go to the actual application class, armor microservice application. And we're gonna be needing to do this for both, both the armor and weapon microservice application classes. So remember how in the on the service registry, application we had to add the eureka server is that what we did here yeah so right here we had to add the enable eureka server annotation so in our armor and weapons all we need to do is add we just need to add the enable discovery client okay and then for armor we've got to do the same thing enable discovery client and we're almost done the only thing we need to do now is just update the application properties so if you open up the application properties in each project okay at the bottom here we'll paste in um, our service URL so this is basically exactly what we used in the service registry applications.xml where we define the localhost and Eureka port. So which means we need to add the Eureka port va variable to our .env. And so our Eureka port, remember, was 8761. So let's paste that into our .env, and now we'll need to do the same thing for 
weapon. So let's add this to weapon and then in the application properties, let's add that default zone value there. So now if we restart both of these services, okay, I don't see anything coming up. Let's restart the armor. So these should be now registering with our service registry. And if we refresh browser page, we should then see our two services. All right. So we now have our armor microservice and our weapon microservice. And so we've got URLs here for the local host, and that's available on localhost port 8081 and 8082. And to double check, let's just go back into Postman. And again, we'll fetch the armors from the same port. And we see it, cloth, chainmail, and plate. And for weapons, we see one-handed, two-handed, and bastard sword. Okay, so the services are still running. They're now available in our service registry, which is really cool. I'm loving this so far. All right, so now back to our diagram. We have the service registry created now, and then now we can create the config server. So one of the neat things in a microservice environment is that we, we can set up another service which just handles configuration. So each of the services that are a part of the service registry can talk to this config server during startup, pull down configuration information for each of these services. So you no longer have to have localized configuration info set up on each of these API servers because ideally when you're working with a distributed environment, which is what a microservice architecture is, there's potential that you'll have these services spread out over over many different areas, like say on AWS or uh, providers like that. And so you'll need to change environment variables depending on where you are for each of these services and depending on which environment you want to, you, you want to put these services in. So for example, you might have a, a production environment where you have different variables for things in your services than a, a test environment or for your own local environment. You'll have different variables and different values that you want to inject into your own uh, API services. So that's the benefit of using a config server. So you can set up different configs for the different environments that you support. And then as each of these API servers come online, they pull the configuration from, that it needs from the configuration server and then goes on its merry way. That was a pretty long explanation. I hope it made sense. So let's go back into the spring initializer. And then what we need to do, we are going to be creating a, another service here called config server. So config dash server. And we'll leave everything the same. Jar, Java 17, 3.3.3. .3 and uh, Maven, Java, okay. Okay, so this is all we're going to need for our config server, our cloud config server. We have a Spring Web dependency, the config server dependency from the Spring Cloud config Spring Boot starters package, and the Spring Boot dev tools. So let's go ahead and generate this. And again, what we'll need to do is add the springboot.env. Hopefully that's big enough to see the springboot.env uh, dependency that we've added in every other project so far. This is such a helpful library to make it easier. Always, okay. So we've got our .env configuration, or we've got our .env dependency listed now. Okay, so now what we need to do is create a .env file. And here we're gonna use server port again of 8088. Okay, and then what we're gonna need to do is in the application properties file, we're gonna need to declare that server port. So let's go ahead and pop that in there. 
And again, this is reading 8088 from the environment file. Now for the, the default for Spring Cloud Config is that because this is meant to be a distributed architecture that you're running this on, we would be, the, the config server would be referencing uh, a source code repository such as GitHub to pull down configuration information from. What we can do is set up a GitHub repository to pull this info from for this demo, but I thought it would be more applicable to just keep this localized. And so the only way to do this with Spring Cloud config server is declaring a active profile of native. So if you want more details on that, just check the documentation, but this is just a way of being able to bypass checking things in GitHub versus uh, finding configuration information locally on your, your local environment. Okay, so in our main class, what we're gonna need to do is add a, another annotation called enable config server. Okay, so we've got our spring our spring.profiles.active to be native. We've declared our server port to be 8088 and now our config server annotation. So the only thing remaining is to actually set up the individual configuration files for each server. So how config server works is when a microservice makes a call to the configuration server, the configuration server will attempt to resolve the given name of the microservice calling it and then return, try to return configuration information based on that name. So in the, if you recall the application name, so in our application.properties, we've got a application name defined here of armor-microservice. And in weapon, we've got weapon-microservice. So Spring Cloud Config will try to resolve weapon-microservice in the name of the configuration to return to this microservice. Let's go ahead and I'll show you what I mean. It will make it a whole lot easier to understand. So in the resources folder, let's create a new folder here called config and let's create a new file here and we are gonna call this armor-microservice.yaml. So the, the configuration information can be in both YAML or properties files. So I'm gonna make one of each. So the armor microservice configuration information is gonna be in YAML and the weapon microservice configuration information is gonna be in a dot properties file, just to show you that it's possible to do both. Okay, so new file and we'll call this weapon microservice dot properties. Okay, so all we need to do now is take the information from the application properties of armor so all of these details so we're going to we're going to comment them out here and we're going to take all these and put them into yaml format in in the config the the new yaml class that we just set up so the armor microservice yaml and then of course we've got to yamlize all of these things as you can see for our armor microservice yaml file we've defined our server port of 8081 and we've defined all, we've taken all of our other variables all of our other values from the properties and just converted these to yaml format but it's the same configuration and we've done the same thing for the weapon microservice properties so we've got that all set up and then now all we need to do is restart so let's go into our dashboard start this up and let's just make sure this starts up okay Okay, and it's now listing on port 8088. So what we can do is go back to our browser and let's look for, so if we go to localhost port 8088, which is our configuration server port, and we use the armor-microservice name slash default, we get the configuration that we have for the armor microservice. So we can validate that it's returning the configuration okay. And now let's try the same thing out for weapon and look at everything that gets displayed. Okay, beautiful. I love, I love this.
Okay, so the configuration server is up and running and it's serving all of our configuration. So now we need to go back into each of these projects and let's stop them. Let's stop the armor and weapon. And we're going to need to add the config client starter package. So let's go back to spring start.io. Let's clear these up and let's add config client. Okay, so we've got our config client and we are also going to add the Spring Boot Actuator dependency. And it looks like we've got everything there. So let's go ahead and hit the Explore button again. And it will show us the packages we need to pull out here. So the dependencies here are the Spring Boot Starter Actuator and the Starter Config. So let's take this and drop them into our Armor and Weapon POM XML files. So here's our Armor project. Let's go into the POM XML and let's drop them right into the dependencies. And let's do the same thing for weapon. Okay, it doesn't matter where. Let's post them here. Okay, and let's let, let it refresh. So we'll go to the other one. Okay, so all we need to do now is, of course, in our application properties, make sure everything is blocked off, which it is. The only thing we need to add to the application properties file now is a path to the config server. So we need a URL. So config server spring.config.import equals optional colon config server http localhost config underscore port. So in our environment variable, we can just create one last in our dot nv file, we can create one last one last variable called config underscore port. We can block these out. Okay, and so see, we have our config uh, URL server there, and let's do the same thing for weapons. Comment all this out, and let's get the config server there, and let's get the config port of 8088, and let's block these two off, just so they're consistent. And that's it, that's all we'll need to do. We won't need to do anything else. So let's go ahead and restart these servers. So let's go back to the dashboard and let's start up the weapon microservice and let's just keep a look out in the logs for any errors. I don't see any, everything looks green, up and running. Okay, let's do the same thing for armor. So everything is up and running and let's go back and again, try our API calls. And we've got our sword, one-handed sword, two-handed sword. And for armor again, we've got the same data coming back. Everything looks good. All right. So the benefit of an API gateway is that now we have this microservice architecture with different microservices servers. One thing that is beneficial to use is what's called an API gateway. And so this is a central gateway that you then make API requests to and then internally this gateway will know because of the service registry it will know which which microservice to talk to and again let's go back to our uh, discovery client and we should see our config service here okay we didn't set that up so let's go back to the start.spring.io and we're calling it api gateway so for our API gateway, the only dependencies we need is the config client, the Eureka discovery client, the Spring Boot actuator, the gateway dependency, which is part of Spring Cloud, and the Spring Boot dev tools. Go ahead and hit generate. Okay, so again, we there's one little detail that we've got to fix in our generated pom.xml file, which took me a while to track down, is that we don't want the Spring, okay, disable that. We don't want the Spring Cloud Starter Gateway MVC. We want the Spring Cloud Starter Gateway. So make sure you change this artifact ID. It'll save you so much time later trying to debug this. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's actually uh, go into our application properties. And again, we need to paste in the URL for the config server. So it's again the same optional config server, HTTP localhost config port, which means in our environment file, let's add config port of 8088. 
Okay, which means we need to add the spring.env dependency to our dependencies list. This whole repository is available on GitHub for this whole project, so I urge you to download it. It's kind of late to mention it now. Download it and follow along as we're building this out. But hopefully my instructions have been clear enough that you've been able to do this as we've been running things. Okay, and then in our API Gateway class here, we just want to enable the discovery client. Okay, and then and then the last thing we need to do is before we can start this up is we need to update the configuration in the config server. Remember how we have all of our configuration pulling from that. So we've got our application name of API Gateway. So back in our config project. Okay, so in the config server environment, let's add another config for the API Gateway. And it's going to be a YAML file. So under the config folder, create a API gateway. YAML. And let's paste in some details and we'll go over them all here. Let's cover this up. Okay, so first of all, we've got our port of 909090. So what we're also declaring here is our uh, Eureka server, our discovery server. And then we also need to add a few things for the gateway package. So we've got Spring Cloud gateway discovery locator. We want to enable the locator and we also want to enable this property called lowercase service ID of true. Let's fix up those names here. Okay. And then, so we've got two routes that we want to define. We've got two microservices. So we've got the armor service. And so we we're, we're, we'll give it an ID of armor dash service for a URI. We've got LB for load balancer. And this is this is what where the API gateway will take over things. Slash slash armor microservice. And so this armor microservice name is the same name that shows up under Eureka. So armor dash microservice and weapon dash microservice. So that's what goes into the into this URI value here. And the predicates that we're listening for is a path of slash api slash v1 slash armors so everything after this path route to this microservice and we're setting up a similar service for the weapon microservice and then we're listening for path of api v1 weapons so let's go ahead and restart the config server here with our new configuration information i shall just stop it and restart it just to make sure and then I'll go back to our API gateway and I will start that one. Okay, so let's go here to our dashboard and let's start this one up. So remember our API gateway is listening on port 9090 and we need the same API endpoints. Uh, we're not changing anything with the path. So in Postman, let's just cut and paste this URL. So instead of referencing port 8081, slash API slash V1 armors. Let's go create a new get request and we're listening at port 9090. So we want to go to localhost port 9090 slash AP1 slash V1 slash armors. And ta-da, look at that. So now we get our cloth, our chain, and our plate mail items. And let's just update the URL and call weapons. And we see our sword, two-handed sword, and bastard sword. And if we refresh this, we should see our API gateway here. Hooray! So everything is all set up within our microservice environment. Oh, that's so cool. This was a really fun project to put together. I thought this was a great fun little project to put together to demonstrate how a microservice architecture is set up and how these different services talk to each other, which you don't really get in a monolithic architecture approach. I hope you had a lot of fun and you learned a ton. Please leave a comment down below if you had any issues or any comments. Give this video a like, subscribe to the channel for notifications on other videos that I'll be preparing soon. And I hope you have a really great day wherever you are. Peace, everyone.